Let's talk about, obviously, the, the big thing we want to dive into, right? You have this long-time television career, and you worked your way up, reporting, covering all sorts of insane stories, working your way up to the anchor desk, which, you know, it's considered the pinnacle, right? The 6 and the 11 o'clock news. Um, but you've been through some stuff because, you know, for people who aren't as familiar with to your story as, you know, loyal WNEP viewers are. You became the news at one point. I became the news, right. And let's unpack that because you left WNEP in 2016. Mm -hmm. But when did stuff hit the fan for you when all of a sudden your name was all over the newspapers, your name was on other news stations, and well, your family was getting crushed in the media? Right. It was. I was, And I was, and the thing is, I was at the height of my career. I mean, uh, you know, you worked with me. You knew... Um, you know, I wasn't just an anchor at 16. I mean, you I... You produced the 6 p.m. Right, news. Right. And you helped tremendously in the editorial meetings. The editorial decisions, I think, every every day and, and, and generating that news content every mm -hmm. day. Um, I, I had... And, and that's the part I loved the most was finding stories. Um, what stories really matter to the people of Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania? And I felt like I had such an advantage because I was born born and raised here. Um, so, I mean, I, nothing, everything was going so well. Every, every, professionally, personally, it was going fantastic. Living You're married? In a, married. Two kids. Two kids. Uh, two daughters, Sarah two, and Rachel. Yes, beautiful, you know, beautiful home. I finally, you know, got that. I was at that level where, oh, wow, you know, a great neighborhood living, living in a, a wonderful town. Everything was just fantastic. And then... Um, it came crashing down. My world came crashing down. Hey friends, hey friends. it's the Ryan Lecky Show. <laughs> welcome to the Ryan Lecky Show. Hey everybody and welcome back to the Ryan Lecky Show. I'm super pumped up today to have on the podcast count <laughs> somebody I worked with, I would say for like 18 years. Yes. Who, if you grew up, lived in northeastern and central Pennsylvania, and you ever watched the ABC affiliate WNEP TV, you knew her voice, you knew her name. The one and only Marisa Burke. Ryan, it is so great seeing you again. We haven't seen yeah. each other for a while. We've and talked off and on right. because we have mutual friends, but we haven't got to sit down just to chat about your life after the anchor chair. Right. And then writing the book that we're going to dive into, just checking scores. Right. So we're going to dive into this. And we can't cover everything because we'd be here like for days. <laughs> but people can read the book to learn more. But we're going to pull back the curtain. The interesting thing, you know, on my own social media, when I told people on Facebook and Instagram that we were going to sit down for a chat, they had a lot of great questions. But probably the biggest one that came up what have you been up to since you left WNEP TV in 2016? Everyone wants to know. They're like, what did she do? Did she leave the state for a while? Like, what exactly happened to you? And I think the other question people didn't know, why did you leave the anchor chair? You were the 6 and the 11 o'clock anchor on WNEP TV for many, many years. Right. In 2016, the company at the time who uh, that owned 16 offered several of us uh, buyouts. And it was just time for me. I, I had been at the top of the mountain. I enjoyed my career at uh, WNEP TV, uh, but it was time and I knew it was time. And um, I left and I was very fortunate. Uh, less than a year later, um, Geisinger Health System offered me a job and I was their national media specialist for a, about a year. Uh, and my job there was to promote the healthcare system to top tier national outlets, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and uh, to get national publicity for Geisinger. And then in 2016 or 2018, I just decided it was time to maybe see another part of the country. My mother was leaving Pennsylvania to move to Colorado to be with my younger brother. So we had family out there. And I thought, you know, uh, after a long career and after being in the area, maybe it's time, maybe it's time for a change. So in 2018, I moved to Colorado Springs 
I've been there ever since, and it's just been a new chapter for me. And uh, two years ago, I was offered a group news director's position for a media management company, and that's what I've been doing. I, I oversee news content for several different television stations in seven, uh, 10 different markets in seven states and in four different time zones, including Alaska. <laughs> Did you think, though, when you left in 2016, weren't you done with the news business? Uh, I thought I was. Um, and I loved my job at Geisinger. I really did. I loved, I loved the team, the marketing and communications team. And I thought, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. But then I, I, gosh, I, I left the area and started up my own business, Marisa Burke Communications, where I did uh, some PR, media relations, a um, little bit of social media. But um, uh, then I, I circled back into news, and, and I love what I'm doing now because I, I get to mentor a lot of multimedia journalists and, um, and interact with, you know, with the corporate level, too. How tough was it, though, to leave? Because you grew up in Danville, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and you've been in this area, northeastern and central Pennsylvania, your entire life, and you're in, you, you know, you weren't 21 when you're like, okay, I'm going to move across the country. How tough was that? I mean, this is what you've known. Right, right. And my friends are here, relatives yeah. are here, family is here. I mean, people I, I've, I've grown up with um, are here. They're still here. And that's what makes this area so special because it's so community related. The, the big thing about moving to a place like Colorado uh, the, the state, the area is full of people from n not in Colorado. <laughs> they're, okay. they're, they're coming from Texas, California. Mm -hmm. So nothing is entrenched. You know, there are no s neighborhoods. There's no community. There's no, there's nothing about traditional food and things like that. Um, that's what I had to get used to. But Yeah, what um, did you miss when you left there? Were you, was it oh, the pizza here? Was it the gosh, food? Gosh, it was the fabulous restaurants that are here. And you don't realize that, Ryan, until you, you leave. leave the area yeah. and then you come back. Um, the, the mom and pop restaurants, we were just at one last night and it was just terrific. It was yeah. so good to be back and have good home hearty food again and taste taste. I don't know if it's the elevation <laughs> out in Colorado yeah. because I'm at, I live at 6,200 feet above sea level. I don't know if it's the altitude, the elevation, yeah. but the food just doesn't taste the same. Yeah. And I agree. I had like, obviously when I would go visit my mom, when she used to live in Florida, I'd be down mm -hmm. there. I'm like, isn't there any good restaurants yeah. around here? I can't wait to get home and eat. Yes. yes. So I agree with you. <laughs> Let's talk about obviously the, the big thing we want to dive into, right? You have this long time television career and you worked your way up reporting, covering all sorts of insane stories, working your way up to the anchor desk, which, you know, it's considered the pinnacle, right? The six and the 11 o'clock news. Um, but you've been through some stuff because, you know, for people who aren't as familiar with to your story as, you know, loyal WNEP viewers are, you became the news at one point. I became the news, right. And let's unpack that because you left WNEP in 2016. Mm -hmm. But when did stuff hit the fan? for you when all of a sudden your name was all over the newspapers, your name was on other news stations, and well, your family was getting crushed in the media. Right, it was, I was, and I was, and the thing is, I was at the height of my career. I mean, uh, you know, you worked with me, you knew, um, you know, I wasn't just an anchor at 16. I mean, you I- You produced the 6 p.m. Right, news, right. and you helped tremendously in the editorial meetings. The editorial decisions, I think, every every day, and, and, and generating that news content every day. Um, I, I had, and, and that's the part I loved the most was finding stories. Um, what stories really matter to the people of Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania? And I felt like I had such an advantage because I was born and raised here. Um, so I mean, I, nothing, everything was going so well. Every, every, professionally, personally, it was going fantastic living You're married, in a married two kids two kids uh, two daughters sarah two, and rachel yes beautiful you know beautiful home i finally you know got that i was at that level where oh wow you know a great neighborhood living living in a, a wonderful town everything was just fantastic and then um it came crashing down my world came crashing down in 2008 and we're going to unpack that. And I think the thing I want 
people to know when they listen to us, you listen to this today and watch it. You and I worked together for 18 years, but this is the first time we're unpacking all of this, what we're about to talk about. And when you talk about the pinnacle of your career, I remember how hard you worked and you were so proud of like the house and the light you, life you built for your family along with your husband at the time and your two daughters. And you were very gracious as well, I should say, when I moved to this area, there were times you and I took the same sick days and you invited me over mm -hmm. to swim at your to house. Swim. It was just mm -hmm. you and me hanging out. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget those days. And the memory I have is you and I in this in your swimming pool and Skycam 16 at the time, the helicopter <laughs> used to fly over your house on sick days and we ran inside so we didn't get <laughs> caught playing hooking. <laughs> That was my memory, but yes. but coming back to the serious topic that I think people really, they wanna know more about and the whys and where your headspace was during this time, 2008. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about it. You're married to Mark Candell at the time. Yes, um, and a terrific guy. He was very well known in the area. He was a top-notch educator. Um, he was working for the NEIU, um, going all over the Northeast to, to districts, um, school districts, and um, basically, you know, teaching teachers how to teach behavior management and, and things like that, curriculum. Um, he was, I mean, he had his PhD in education. He was smart, charming, funny. Um, f we had circles of friends and we were in social circles that it was it, it was terrific because of of what I did what he did um, and uh, I it was in May of 2008 when I had uh, just come off of a newscast and um, I got a phone call from him and he said um, it was right after the weekend and he said um, I'm at the district attorney's office and I may be in some trouble. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, um, well, while you were away with the girls, and I was, I was in Danville the, the weekend prior uh, visiting my mom, um, I had some guys over. And it seems as though one of the guys snuck in, he was only 17 years old, and he ratted out on me. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, instead, uh, he was apparently out all night, but instead of saying that he was out with his friends, he ratted out on me and said that he was at our house drinking all night and his, um, his family went to the uh, law enforcement and um, the authorities got involved and he said so I may be in trouble I said well what kind of trouble and he said well 17 years old and he was drinking so it will be underage drinking I hung up the phone from him it, it, in just shock I, I, I just I was numb and not too long after that the assistant district attorney had called and said your husband might be in a lot of trouble and uh and he was talking about charges not just underage drinking but he had thrown out corruption of minors now you and i both know being in the news business we know what criminal charges are we know how how what the punishment can be and when there is something like corruption of minors you're looking immediately at possibly serious time behind bars. And I'm thinking, I just, I, I, I was in shock. I just, I was, I was floored. So it goes from the phone call with the district, from Mark calling you from the mm -hmm. district attorney's office saying, hey, I think I'm in trouble underage stuff. When did the call come in again from the, the assistant district attorney where you said, this is a lot more than what you think? Minutes later. And they called you to either, was it giving you a heads up or trying to bring you in to see if you knew anything? I think it was a little bit of both. So what happened? Did you go down to that office? So it was, um, you know, time had passed. Um, it, and, and in 2008, I mean, um, what had happened is really in two parts, but the first part was 2008. Um, and we were just waiting for uh, uh, the, the big shoe to drop. Well, as it turned out, with the investigation and um, – and dynamics of well who was at the party what did that really happen you know that kind of thing they they downgraded the charges i mean it looked like it was going to be corruption of minors but it, it and it turned out to be um um uh, underage drinking but during that time i mean it was just it was just the agony of waiting for the court papers and then 
um, as you know, um, not too long after that, we had uh, taken a trip out to Michigan for my niece's graduate high school graduation, and that's when it. Everything, and when you say we, was he with you? Was, yes. Yep. It was the entire family that we went out for my niece's high school graduation, and then that was when I got the phone call from the general manager at WNEP saying, um, we just saw on the news on the competition, um, lead story, you had told us before this that it was really nothing, that it was just going to be, you know, some kid ratting out your husband, and if anything, it might be underage drinking, but they're not, they're playing this up. It's the lead story, and my, you know, I remember that phone call, and the general manager was on that call. My news director was on that call. And again, I just, my world just caved in. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, because they said that they had seen the, my pictures of my house. I remember that story on the, on the competitor. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing the reporter do stand-ups in front of your house, and I remember it what was that devastating. story looked like. It was devastating because, uh, Brian, you know in the news business it, it you know we were we've always been on the other side okay mm -hmm. i've always been on the other side you know we we were used to reporting the news and, and yes we tell reporters to go out and try to knock on doors and things like that well all of that was now happening to me you were the because, lead story uh, yes on the competition yes so you're in michigan but I, I guess the question is what was the story before you took the trip to michigan that you told the station management were you did you did you as soon as you got the call did you walk in there and say i want to give you a heads up were you very yes. proactive and yes. forthcoming yes and i had told them everything what, what was going on everything that i knew from mark because mark was also kind of downplaying it as well it's it's just the 17 year old it he was the one who ratted it out on me it's just the 17 year old nobody else is making a big deal of it was well, we later found out it was yeah it was mostly college age kids it's still underage. You're still under 21, and you had these people in our home drinking, and they're under 21. How many years were you married? Oh, gosh. Mark and I got married in 1994, and this happened in 2008. Was he gay? Um, at that time, I wasn't even thinking about that. Not even... Not even, even rumors? No. So I could tell you that when I started the station, there's always buzz. And I want to ask you, did you guys have an open relationship, an open marriage? Yeah, it was. It was, it was open in the aspect where you dated other people and he dated other people. While we were married? Yes. No. Okay. Uh, so, at least I don't think from him on his side. <laughs> so, right. So you were not seeing anybody else at no. the time when you were married? No. And you had no inclination that he was in the guys? No, absolutely not. Because of our life together, our private life together. and we So you were still were, intimate? Mm -hmm, we okay. were still intimate, yes. So it wasn't like we weren't intimate for years and there was any red flags? No. Mm -mm. So walk me through. You're in Michigan. Yeah. Stuff starts hitting the fan again. Yeah. You feel like my life is imploding. He's with you. Your kids are with you. What were those calls you were getting? The general manager called, uh, said general you're manager the lead called. story on the competitor. Mm -hmm. yes. You're not even in the state. Not even in the state. And what was what what were all these charges coming up? And uh, it was just a, a huge story on the competition about he had hosted an underage drinking party. And that was the story. And the fact that it was, I mean, remember it was so, it was, that much more intense because he was an educator. He was a local educator. So we're mm -hmm. talking about uh, uh, an educator um, who now is accused of furnishing alcohol to minors. Okay. So at the time, these charges didn't escalate to corruption of minors. Those were squashed a little bit? They, I think they didn't have the evidence mm -hmm. that they thought thought they had and we should say this is one of two parts yes this is part one this is part one what was that drive like back from michigan and what did you do next very little words spoken on the trip back um i did uh tell him i said you have to tell the girls 
I'm not telling the girls. You have to tell the girls. You have to sit down and explain to them what is going on, and you have to let them know that you are now in trouble with the law. Um, and they didn't have any inclination because I think in the nothing. day and age where these kids are all texting each they other, were, yeah, but they no were, one tipped them off. No, no, no. Um, but it, the, the, the good thing was it happened at the end of the school year. And so we had kind of a buffer between the, their, the time that they would be with their friends in school to the start of school because it, all this came down at, toward the end of May, early June. Of 2008. Of 2008. So you come back. What happened legally? Like, walk me through the process. Did you have um, court hearings and then some things seemed to go he away had, for a while? Yep, he had his typical court hearing. He decided to plead guilty um, because he thought it would be the easiest thing. He knew what the punishment was going to be, which was 90 days of house arrest. Um, but he lost everything, Ryan. He lost his career. He lost, he, he, I mean, he lost his Pennsylvania license to teach, his certification to teach. He lost everything. What, but... I still supported him. I, I believed him when he said it was the 17-year-old who ratted him out. Um, and, and at the time, it appeared as though uh, the prosecutors were really looking for something more. And to me, it seemed like a prosecutorial witch hunt because of who I was. And I thought, you know, they're they thought we're going to take down Marisa Burke's exactly. husband. Exactly. They're yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. It would be the bigger trophy on the mantle. And um, because my house was raided not too long after this, uh, it was I think it was the last day of school. And um, th our house was raided. They were you sent home or people. At work? I was home. They sent, Pete, they sent um, two investigators up, and uh, they took our computers, they took cameras, they took uh, a slew of electronics, um, they took pictures of my home. Every, they went into every room and took pictures of my home. Um, I, I felt, oh my gosh, what are, you, what are you searching for? And we allowed them to do it. And um, the invested, the detectives at the time said, well, we could do this one of two ways. We can go ahead and get um, a search warrant, but that's all public record. Okay, so, you know, you're, you're so you're wiggy about the media. Um, or we can do it now and we can keep a hush-hush. Well, as it turned out, it did leak. Um, and uh, I think it was about a week or so later. I mean, it was in... The, the newspaper and and I think the again it was a story that came out that um, the competitor covered uh, right. Do you agree with the statement? Because working in our newsroom at WNEP, people think we at the ABC botched the story, dropped the ball because you were the main anchor, and almost it looked like initially that they didn't want to cover it because it was related to you. Um, I totally understand um, why they handled it the way they did both in the beginning and a few days later. Because that was the because, perception from the public. Think Talkback well, 16. Well, and it was, it was right. Media. And yeah. it was my explanation to Ryan. Remember, I went and I talked to my supervisors and said, I don't think this is a big deal. I think this is, I think it's, I think it's going to bl all blow over. I think we're going to be okay. Um, and I didn't know at that time yeah. how, what the punishment was going to be like to Mark. So yeah, they, they, they were reading me. And then, so they they held back, but then when they saw the competition, when it so when it leaked, then right from the right, raid, correct? Exactly. So when they raided your house, walk me through what happened after well, that. Well, then it was it, in it, papers, the exactly. competition, exactly. And, and, and then we picked it up as well. I mean, this, our WNEP, where you worked, reported. your station had to report on absolutely. Yeah. Yes. What was that like? And well, they gave me a leave of absence in two thousand eight. They said, um, you know, too much stuff is coming out. We don't know what's going to come out now, mm -hmm. what's next, when's the next shoe going to drop? And they said, how about you take a leave of absence? And they gave me a six-week leave of absence that summer in 2008. The girl, the, my, my children loved that I was home all summer long, but, I mean, it was, it was intense. And let me tell you something. I didn't know if I was returning 
to the station. I was just going to ask that. The whole time in the six weeks, you, did you think they're going to fire me any minute? Absolutely. Absolutely. And looking back, um, and I, 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 I say it publicly now, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe they should have let me go. Because, you know, remember, our, the, the WNEP has the, the image that, that that station has built over the years so family oriented. I mean, you know, everybody on the air is is family to everybody at home, and the folks at home are part of our family. And it was that 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 wholesome image that the station has tried fought, tried and and succeeds all the time to have that wholesome family image. Well, then something like this happens, you know. I I, I was really surprised that I was not let go. And I, even even though I was not involved with this, with his trouble, I was still surprised that the station did not let me go. So when we talk about, so there was the first time, right, then you go to Michigan. The second time is when the house is raided, when things are really starting to hit the mm-hmm. fan. What were the conversations like at home? Did you ever just say, like, that's it, I want a divorce, I'm, I'm done, I don't. Tr-. Did you ever say, I don't believe you? No, not in 2008. See, that's where... I, I still loved him. I still supported him. I thought they're out to get us. They're out. I, that's all I kept on saying. They're out to get but us. But the they're evidence they us. presented, I guess, or brought up and said, here's why we're raiding your house. This is why we're doing A, B, and C. You, as this amazing journalist or reporter, you've done investigations. There was nothing that went off to said, maybe he is doing what they're saying. No, because they, they really didn't have... Um, what, what, for a search warrant, they did, you know, they, they need to show you, um, um, concrete evidence of why they're searching your probable place. Cause, it, probable proof, cause, right. yes. And they really didn't have that. They were, they were, I think they were, and that's what it appeared to me. They were just, oh my gosh, I kept on saying they're out to get us. They're out to get us. What are they looking for? What are they looking for? So let's talk. So then after the house is raided, it makes the news. You take a six week leave of absence. Mm-hmm. You're thinking the whole time I could get fired any day now. Mm-hmm. And then what happens? They call you back to work. Well, first of all, um, <laughs> and it's in the book how I went. I, I, they, not, I wasn't hearing anything about the items and electronics and belongings that they had taken from. They had removed from our house in the raid. And. Weeks were going by, and I said, "You know, I want I want the the computer back for my kids. It's we're you know they they're going to need the computer when school resumes. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And <laughs> just one day, I went to the district attorney's office and I demanded everything. I said, "You haven't said anything about anything." And they finally admitted. They said, "No, we didn't find anything on your, on your computers. Nothing on cameras. Nothing. They found nothing." And I was I was just so angry, Ryan, because at that point I was I was thinking, "See, I knew all along. I knew it all along that you were just, you know, trying to make something out of nothing, and you know, you were out to get us because of who I am and who Mark was, and that's what was going through my mind." in 2008. But there was another bomb about the drop, right? Mm -hmm. So did you come back to work after six weeks? And during that time in six weeks, I know, you know, I shot you a text, a number of people probably did. What did your, did the team at NEP, anybody you were close to reach out and connect with you? Or did you want to go dark and not talk about it? I did. I did go dark. Um, Even my closest friends here, they will tell you that uh, we tried calling Marisa several times. And she would not pick up. She would not pick up. I mean, my my mother tried calling me, and I did. I just, I I retreated, and I just I said I, I've I can't I can't deal with anybody, and uh, I cannot. I don't want to talk about this with anybody. I'm embarrassed. I'm humiliated. Remember, I mean, the stories had my name in. Remember, it was always Mark. Candle, the husband of Newswatch 16's Marisa Burke, and I was the 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 public humiliation and embarrassment was excruciating for me. I that summer I remember dropping like 20 pounds. I just I stopped eating. It was 
It was absolutely horrible. And um, during this time, during when you were home time. for six weeks, did your ex, well, husband at the time, Mark, did he tell your kids what was going on? When did you approach that, and what was that conversation like with your girls? Because at the time, what they were in high school? They were no, they were. I think they were in middle school. Um, but it, it, but they, they were both at a very impressionable age, and um, he talked to them very calm, cool. Uh, like a very casual conversation. And that was the thing that I thought was so intriguing at the time as well, uh, that he was just so calm about everything, that he, he, you know, he was losing his career. He was losing his license to teach in Pennsylvania. But he, it, it seemed to me that he thought, well, you know, Marisa's still working. We still can live in the house everything is okay. I'll get over this. And he was just so calm about everything. And at none of these discussions, I should say, when you're home before you go back to work, before the second bomb drops, did you say like, are you, did you, are you having sex with God? Are you gay? Like never Uh, came up or not in 2008. Do you regret not asking that question then? Absolutely. Yes, I do. In 2008, um, but remember, at that time, again, every my life was so perfect. And I was thinking, I, you know, perhaps I don't want to deal with that or ask that for fear of what I'm going to hear. So I'm just going to stay in my little comfort zone, in my little box, and try to make my life as normal as possible for both me and the girls and the guy I married. Remember, everything was just so perfect. You go back to work after the six week break, right? They finally call you back. And you think things are kind of like, where did things stand from the legal side? Are you like, I think things are clearing up. I'm gonna go back on the anchor desk. Walk me through the next few weeks. Well, in the fall, uh, he was sentenced. It was that October that he was sentenced for one count of underage drinking. Mm -hmm. And then he was put on 90 days house arrest. And then after that, it was what I thought was over. When did the second bomb drop? So you're back to work. And let me ask you this, because I noticed it watching you work, because you and I would see each other often. Do you feel like you were more compassionate on stories after you were on the other side of it. I felt like when you went back after that six weeks, you weren't, I mean, you were, people would say, you were like a savage journalist. You got to the bottom of stuff, right? Do you feel like you went back and maybe tried to look at things with a little bit more grace before the second bomb dropped? Yeah, I do. I, and, that, and that's a very good question and, 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 and very observant because, yeah, I, I think I pulled back as a journalist because of what had happened. Yeah. Because at the time, you, as in your words, thought this is a witch hunt. Mm-hmm. And how many times, as journalists, right? Oh, so and so's charged, and it's like, boom, lead story. Exactly. And I noticed that with you, but I guess going back to work then, you thought, okay, things are leveling out, and he does his 90 day house arrest. Right. He leaves education. Right. Um, but at the time, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I read your book a bit back, was he still mentoring young guys? in your house before the second bomb dropped? Yes. So the question is that people would want to know, why would you allow that after what he went through just to cover your butt? Because he he was so good at the performance end of it. And um, even even my children at one point said, Dad, you know, my, our, our classmates are showing up at the house and you're helping them with homework, you're, you're helping them get ready to, to, for entrance exams for college and things like that, but why are you hanging out with them? Why, why, why do you have this friendship? This and, is guys and, who are like 17, yes, 16. Yes. But there's no alarms that went off for you being like, this is a bad look, this is not good, and now I'm... St- I'm- because everything that we had seen, including my girls, was he would, he, he had, when they would come to the house, 
it was. It was schoolwork. It was mentoring. It was getting them ready for college entrance exams, things like that, um, studying with them. Um, but then, you know, on, on, on certain occasions, there would be um, a young high school guy showing up to do yard work. And I'm thinking, well, how do you know him? And it was always, and every question that we had for him, it was, well, um, I met him at the gym, or he's a friend of Rachel's, or he's also on the swim team, and that's how I know him. And, or it, 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 every question that you gave Mark, he was excellent at coming up with immediate answers. And the confidence that he had and the performance that he gave, it, you, was, it, was, it was convincing. It? You bought it. It was convincing. Absolutely. Because the thing I think that's always been your wheelhouse, and other people say this, who've worked with you in a newsroom, yeah. you can smell bullshit from a mile away. Yeah, but with him, it didn't seem like bullshit. It re I mean, it was, remember, he, he, was, he was living a double life. And he, he I mean, looking back at it, was I, was I bamboozled by, by his charm and his humor and his intelligence yeah i was because he i mean gosh that's what i fell in love with so you come back to work mm -hmm. how long were you at work until all of a sudden the second bomb dropped that ended everything well four years had gone by because because we're you know the first piece of trauma happened in 2008 and then 2012 happens and it was that fall of 2012 when we started having weird things happen around our property like for a couple of days in a row and it was close to halloween but i'm thinking no this is these aren't halloween pranks um it, it, we started getting toilet paper around our property and bushes and things like that. And then uh, the one night we we got eggs thrown at our door. And I said to Mark, do you, do you have any idea what this may be about? And he said, um, no, I have no idea. All I can think of is just it, it's kids doing this because they know who lives here. And I'm thinking, I don't know, this just doesn't seem right. Um, and then it stopped not a few days later. Um, that's when, again, everything caved in. And what month and year is this now? This is October. And um, the year was what? And the year was 2012. All right. So 08 was the first time. Yeah. Now it was after. Yeah. It was actually after Halloween. So it was the beginning. It was the beginning of November when, um, and this is how I started the book, was um, I had just done the noon news. I had just finished anchoring the noon newscast. And I had gotten back to my desk. And at that time, Ryan, I was not one to take my phone out to the set. Mm -hmm. I left my phone at my desk and I picked up the phone. And I saw that it was my neighbor across the street had left a voicemail. And when I listened to the voicemail, it was my neighbor saying that, uh, he said, Marisa, I don't know whether you know this or not, but I'm looking out my window and I see state police, the FBI, local police, and it looks like they are trying to break down the front door of your home and they have your home surrounded. And this is the voicemail that my neighbor left and that I retrieved right after I had anchored the new news. And I thought, oh my gosh, here we go again. And what did you do? Go tell your boss I got to go home. That's immediately. I, I walked into my supervisor and said, I think something's going on in my neighborhood. Not sure what it is. Didn't, and I didn't give him any details. Um, and all my news director had said was, well, if it is something, call us and we'll send a camera up there. And little did I know that what had happened. And, I, I, and then when I, I, so I hopped in the car 
But right. I mean, at the time, you knew it was your house. Yeah, oh, absolutely. But you're just, you didn't have all the, I guess, everything in a, like all the ducks in a row where you're like, yeah. here's what's going on. Mm-hmm. But you kind of didn't tell them what was happening. You kind of said, just Ex- something's happening in exactly. my neighborhood. Exactly. Yeah. So you go home. So I go home. And it's quiet. It's eerily quiet in the neighborhood. There are no police, no nothing. Everybody's gone. And I tried calling Mark several times about what is going on. No answer, no answer, no answer. And the reason that there was no answer was because the authorities had raided our home again, confiscated his phone, And that's why there was no answer when I tried calling him. But when I showed up, again, he was there. I said, what in the world is going on? And he said, well, um, I may have gotten into some trouble because I was texting some guys and I think they found out about it. And um, I said, well, what do you mean texting? And he said, well, they were sexual in nature. And that's all he said. And, and how old were the guys? And they were, I, they were high school age, 17. Yeah, 16, 17. And what did you respond to when he said that? At that time, um, I, my first thing was I have to go and get the girls. I have to go and get Rachel and Sarah and get them out of school before things blow up, before um, it's... It, it's, I mean, at that time, social media was exploding. And I said, I have to go. My, my prime concern was their welfare. So I had gone to their high school and removed them. And I said, I think your father may be in trouble again. We're going we're gonna to go back. And, um, and that night... Uh, Nothing, nothing had happened. Like they, they, the, the authorities came in, they raided the home, but he wasn't charged with anything um, at that time. Uh, but they had just confiscated, again, computers, electronics, cameras, phones, um, iPads. Um, but it was that evening when he and I were alone in the kitchen and I I, I, that is when I had my epiphany with him. And I said, so you did this, you've been, you, you did this knowing full well, it was against the law. And he said, yes, with tears in his eyes. And I said, you know what, this time you're on your, I'm done. You're on your own. I am totally done. This is it. I cannot go through this again. When did you call the station to tell him what was happening? Well, the next day, um, I think. Well, did it you come was, back to work? Yes, yes. The next day, I went back to work. No, but I mean, like, so the afternoon. What did you tell your bosses? You no, said, not I think the so. same day. Not the same day. So you came um, back to do the news that night? It, it, no, 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 no. I stayed out that night with the girls, and. Um, but what did you tell your employer? Because remember, you said, "Oh, something's yes. going on in my neighborhood. I'll be right back." Yes, I, I, you know what? I called the news director, yeah. and I said, um, "There, there was something." And I, 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 I wasn't forthright, Ryan. I, I didn't tell them what had happened. And I said, you know what? There was an incident. I'll tell you more about it tomorrow. And that was it. But I can't come back into work. And, you know, at the time, I was <laughs> fortunate that they, they were okay with it. Do you think they knew it was related to your husband? Because, I think so. All right. I think so. And then the next day, I, I believe it was election day, so we were tied up with elections. And then the day after election day, That's when uh, my boss, my news director, had called me in and said, Marisa, we just got word that they're going to arrest Mark. And that was the day after Election Day. And what did you do? Because you knew they had to cover it. Mm -hmm. Um, I I left (laughs) and I said, I've got to get home. And again, I took the girls out of school and... um, it was just reliving 2008 all over again. It was that, that, that sick feeling that you have in your stomach that, um, that you're just numb. And then you're wondering, what do I do now? 
what happens now? And where was he? Did you kick him out of the house that night? He he was arrested. They they took him. Um, oh, this is on the the day after election day. The day, day after election day, and um, he they arrested him, and um, but he made he made bail, so he was able to, and I don't I'm, I'm I, I would have to look again, but I mean he he made bail. I don't know if it was that first or second night, and yeah, he came back to the house, and it. Why did you let him in? Well, it, that lasted a couple of days, Ryan. And then it was, and then I, I threw him out of the house after that. I said, you, you can't, you can't stay here. So you can't live here. Right. I think if I recall in the book, he went to a relative's house. Yeah. So what played out after that? Because this is sort of the start of the, I mean, he was just arrested again. So yeah. there was no sentencing, et cetera. What happened after that? Then again, it was, it, well, it was a much bigger case. I mean, first of all, the case was on the county level, so it was the district attorney's office. But because it was it involved a communication device, and because of the uh, number of guys who were involved who had approached prosecutors saying, "Yeah, he was texting me. Yeah, he was texting me. Yeah, he was texting me." Um, It just, the case ballooned. The county sent it over to the feds, and then the feds took it over. And then it was the beginning of December that the feds took it over. He was arrested again, brought to federal court, and put behind bars, and that was it. He never was free again. At one point, did you file for a divorce? It was a couple of months after that. After the December. Mm-hmm. And what was he ultimately sentenced to? 14 and a half years, which is a long time. Mm-hmm. And you, because you know, we've covered some cases where people sentenced for a homicide do not get 14 and a half years. The judge thought the case was so serious because of the number of guys involved and that they, you know, the prosecutors felt that he was grooming. He was grooming. He was, he was a predator. And the, the judge basically gave him a really harsh sentence because of that, because they knew he was a predator. So when this all happens in December, then this is 2012 still. 2012. What happened in your life after that, after you started saying, you know, I want, you filed for divorce, he's yeah. in prison, your girls, how, how did you navigate this with them? I tr- Were they angry at him? Did they talk to him? Uh, no. No, they did not. Um, they never wanted to talk to him. They never wanted to go see him in jail because he, he, he was held there until the, the court case went through, but, um, never wanted to speak to him, never wanted. I think they were, they remember Ryan, these guys, some of them were in their class. They were classmates. So, you know, I talk about my humiliation, think about their humiliation and that their father is all over the news. And to, to their credit, I think, looking back, um, I think they were trying to protect me and make me feel better by not showing their emotions, by not showing how hurt they were and the betrayal they felt. They were, they were so close with their dad. They loved their father, loved him. And for this to happen to a child and the betrayal and the embarrassment, um, it's, it's traumatic. You were still working then after all this mm-hmm. rolled out. What was that like? I mean, trying to do your job every day, being in the public eye and knowing what happened? Well, you know, uh, I had an angel come into my life 
not long after the feds took over the case and, and he was behind bars. And um, she was an attorney. And she said, you have got to file for divorce. And you can't wait. Because I knew it was in the wings, but I, I thought I have too much to deal with right now. I've got to make sure that my life is normal as much as it can be and, and for the sake of the girls. Um, but she said, no, you have got to do it now because you have got to have that disconnect with him and you have got to show your employer that you are cutting ties with this guy so that they know that you are totally, you know, you're done with him. You're, you're, he's out of the picture and you have got to make that commitment. And thank goodness she gave me that advice because I jumped on, on filing for a divorce immediately after that. And, um, and I had to, and it was good because up until that point, remember that every story that was on the air mentioned me. I was dragged into his scandal. It was the husband of Newswatch 16's Marisa Burke. I mean, and it was over and over and over and every Yeah, every just because update. he was busted in December, right, or he right. was in prison then. Exactly. That, that carried, headline yeah. continued to it, carry. The headline continued. There was a report, and I tell me if this is accurate, one of your, your ex-husband's accusers ended up getting in trouble with the law down the road for something totally unrelated to mm -hmm. this. And there was a report that you wrote a letter to the judge mm -hmm. on company letterhead from WNEP. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't the judge. It was, it was the prosecutor. And you wrote a letter yes. basically saying this person should get the severest punishment, Absolute, blah, blah, blah. Yes. And they were one of your husband's accusers yep. who was busted for something else. Yep. Totally Ooh. overstepped my boundaries. And do, is that something I regret? Absolutely. And I, I, I mention it in the book. Um, but again, I was just, I was so, so, so angry. And that was after, that was after 2008. Remember that my, my feelings toward Mark in 2008 were still, I love you. I support you. They're out to get us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that was, that was after the 2008 incident where, yeah, this young gentleman had gotten in trouble. And I, I, I and the le my letter was, see, I told you, we told you all along, you know, this, this kid was bad news. And um, mm -hmm. it was, it was looking back, that was another instance where probably the station should have let me go because of what I did. And as it, as it turned out, I mean, they gave me, Ryan, a firm warning. You don't do this. They found out about it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I guess the, the, before we get to just some other questions people had on social media, one of them I, I do want to dive into. When Mark, your ex, was sent to prison, right, in that December time frame. Yes. Is it true? Did you give his old suits to your co-anchor? Yes. That is true. That is true. Yes. And he took them and wore them. Warm. Took the suits. Yeah, okay. he, he, yeah, but did he wear them? I, you know, I, I can't answer that. Just curious, that. yeah. But no, that, that is true, yeah, because I was clearing out Mark's closet, mm -hmm. and I wanted everything out of there. I didn't want any, anything of him. Because it was almost like contamination. I wanted it out of the house. The other question is from people, why write the book? What did you want people to take from it? First of all, for me, Ryan, it was, I had to come to terms with everything that had happened. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I will tell you this, I know before I left the station how bitter I was, how angry I was, um, and, be, and, and hostile. And sometimes I was, I was downright hostile to coworkers. And I thought, this, this is not me, and this cannot go on. I can't have this, this, uh, this anger and bitterness hanging over me for the rest of my life because of what happened. You know, oh, how could this happen to me? Why did this happen to me? And I, that, that it, was, it was really, really dragging me down, and I just felt 
so angry with the world. Um, so I had to come to terms. I had to do something that would bring me some sense of peace. And I needed to channel that, that anguish and despair into strength and resolve. I, I, I knew I had to do that. Otherwise, I couldn't go on with my life. I really, really could not. Your kids weren't happy about the book. Um, they Did the under, book impact your relationship with your daughters? They, I think for um, my Sarah, it did. I think, remember, Sarah was the one who showed up for Mark's sentencing. The day he was sentenced, the day the judge said... 14 years. 14 and a half years. Sarah was the one who... Um, showed up at that day. I was not there in the courtroom. Um, the prosecutors wanted me there. But I said, you know what, I can't do that. It, 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 I'm not going to turn Judge Caputo's courtroom into a circus. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, but Sarah found the courage and bravery to, to stand there and basically say, you know, my father is the epitome of selfishness. And he, you know, he ruined our lives. And she was, what, she was only, what, a sophomore in high school. And um, I, 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 again, I think it took a toll on the both of them. I do. Um, uh, for a while, Sarah was, was um, struggling with her sexuality and finding herself and finding who, who, sh who, they are, mm -hmm. and and I think my Rachel um, has been, she's been all over the world, Ryan, but I think in a way she's, she's still running. I think Rachel is still running, and she's, because she's, she wants to see the world. She wants to, she doesn't want to stay in one place. She wants to, it's that distraction, if you will, that, if I keep, if I, if I go to a different place, I won't remember the past, you know, type thing. So do I think it has had a toll on the two of them? Yeah, I do. Do you think they're stronger because of all this? I hope that they're stronger, but I cannot say for sure. I can't, I can't say to you now that I think they're stronger. I'm, I am not sure. The book is titled Just Checking Scores. Why did you name it that? Uh, before, his, before his arrest in 2012, um, he was constantly looking at his phone. Um, looking at, he constantly was looking at his phone. So much to the point where I had established a rule that at dinner time, if anybody brings their phone to the dinner table, I'm going to take the dog on phone and throw it out the front door. Um, and after a while, even his kids would say, Dad, you're, you're constantly looking at your phone. What is on your phone? And he would always, he was a big sports fanatic. He could spit off stats like that. And his, 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 his line was, just checking scores. I'm just checking scores. I'm looking at the sports. I'm just checking scores. And that's all it was, all the time. And we're thinking, well, he is a sports fanatic. Maybe he is. But, and In that meantime, was, that was my thought. was checking scores. And exactly. Yeah. But I thought, I, I, I thought, oh, my gosh. It was, it was so pivotal. And I thought, that might be a really good title for the book. The takeaway out of all of this, do you feel as though it's taught you to be more empathetic, to be to offer people more grace? Because you said yourself a few minutes ago, yeah. you were really tough at work. And I know some of the Young Buck reporters, right, would be like, man, she unloaded on me, and I don't think uh -huh. she should have went to that extreme. Yeah, you were Exactly. Do you think some of that anger you had at home carried into work, and sometimes you would just? Oh, absolutely. So, so hypercritical of everything and everybody. Like I said, it was, it was, it was that bitterness. And that's, 
I think, and, and now it's, I'm a, I am a different person. I, I truly mean that. I'm more tolerant, patient, seeing all sides. Um, Do you think now as a leader with another orga- news organization mm-hmm. and now mentoring other up-and-coming journalists, do you feel this lesson you learned in your life is helping you make them better and also helping them tell better stories that are more fair and maybe just not blasting somebody at truly the first yeah, charge? Because you, you, when you go through a traumatic experience like this, um, it, it, it really it teaches you a lot about um, about life and life as a whole and. W- where your life is going, what it all means, what you mean to people, and and how your behavior and your actions are going to affect others. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's yeah, I, I am a I am a much different person than I was right before I left WNEP. And I want to say there's a ton more into the book that you talk about. This is just scratching the surface. There's more to it. So when people hear Just Checking Scores by Marisa Burke, where do they find it? How do they get it? So they can learn more and, and dive into the behind the scenes of what was going on when you weren't on camera. You mean how they can... How do they buy it? How they buy Well, it's, it's, you can, it's, it's easy. It's Amazon, Walmart, um, yeah, m- mainly okay. Amazon. Do you um, think, by the way, I heard rumors from other people that this may be possibly turned into a a movie well this past october um it was featured on the um, investigation discovery channel Mm -hmm. um their series who the bleep did i marry they were it was season seven and i think it was episode two um they picked it up they right after the book was released i had heard from producers of um investigation discovery and um they came they, they, they came to Colorado for three days. We shot, and um, very much like this, you know, interviewing me for hours. And um, so that aired the, the last October. Um, and then just very recently, uh, we got word from a screenwriter in uh, Toronto and a producer out in Hollywood that they picked up interest in the book. The screenwriter is now putting together what they call a treatment to present to producers in California. And that's where we are. And we're, we're. How do you feel about that though? Because I mean, it's basically, I mean, you were through, excuse my language, a shit storm. And now it's. You know what though, Ryan, here's, here's the thing that here's the point where I'm at now. After, after the book came out, I received hundreds, hundreds of messages through Facebook, through social, from people who had a story themselves. And they shared that story with me. And they said, you know, your book actually helped me get on the right path. Um, Because I felt the way you did. I was so bitter and angry and hostile to everyone, family, friends, you name it. But after reading your book and how and and to and to read on on what you did to overcome this horrible time, this horrible period in your life, it 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 helped me. And and seriously, I cannot tell you, hundreds of people have since said your book really helped me. And if I could help one person with the book, that was my goal. I thought, you know, it, it's. The, the betrayal, the deceit, the lying, um, the stealing was bad enough, what had happened. Especially because in the book you talk about, I mean, there was oh, money yeah. disappearing oh, left gosh. and right. Everything. And that's everything. why I said there's more to it that you should read yeah, in the book. Because yeah. your finances were all of a sudden, you're like, where's all this money going? Absolutely. So all yeah. of that. And then you accentuate it because I was a public figure. I was so well known in the area it just made it 20 times worse to switch gears onto a lighter note to get to some of the social questions people ask 
Do you keep in touch with anyone who you worked with at WNEP anymore? I don't think I know that many people at WNEP People anymore. asked, does she ever talk to her old anchors, Nolan, Mike Lewis, Scott Schaefer? Have you talked to anybody since then? And what was that? I guess the thing is, too, not to come back too much to the book, but, you know, there was times you had to be on the set where your co-anchor was reading the story yes. about your husband. What was that like? I Because well, you produced the sex. I produced the show which meant I was responsible for lining up the stories right. of that newscast. But they wrote the stories about your husband. But we had to air yes. the stories right. about But you didn't Mark. write it. Um, or did you? No, I did not write the stories. But they had to be in the newscast that I was anchoring. Yep. So I had to choreograph that newscast so that my co-anchor would read the story. And maybe a few stories after that, before to, you took it before back over. I appeared on camera. Yeah, so you don't talk to many people from back there. That's what people wanted to know. Yeah, um, no, and I think I think a ma big reason for that, don't forget, is that I'm not living here anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And the last thing is people said, how does she still look the same? <laughs> No, no. <laughs> they said after all and these years, she looks the same as no, she did on television. No, and that is way too kind. No, I have noticed the age spots and the wrinkles yeah. and the, you know. But no, that's very kind to say. But, um, you know, when, <laughs> when you reach 60, and it's great being 62 now. Um, when you reach 60, you, you, you get to a point in your life where... That kind of thing doesn't matter anymore, and you don't really care about what people think of you mm -hmm. and your image. I mean, this was so traumatic because you know I was still I was still young when all mm -hmm. of this happened. Um, but you know, now that I'm in my 60s, you really that's what's so great about your 60s. It's like you know you've you've done the impressions, you've impressed enough people, okay, <laughs> and you don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. And I don't, and I'm fine with that any final thoughts i mean i really appreciate you just being letting anything go which i knew you would be yeah and, and i i said this is this is the interview that we did not have to prep her and, and everything was on the table with you and i appreciate oh that. absolutely it, you know and when i and ryan when i did my book tour um right after right after the book was released um and i did i came back to the area um and you know the the one the biggest question that i got in every single location where I talked about the book was, how did you not know? Yeah. How did you not know about that? And you touched upon it in this conversation. And, the, and it's the, my answer was, is real easy. He, he led a double life. Um, I mean, look at, look at all the other figures, you know, Matt Lauer, uh, uh, Charlie Rose, Bill O'Reilly. I mean, they were all brought down with, you know, sexual harassment charges, you know, but that wasn't the person we saw. That wasn't the person in the newsroom. Yeah, of course, you know, it's, it's so people and, and people who lead a double life like that are very good at it if they are motivated and they have, you know, one goal in mind and, he needed some sort of sexual gratification from those young guys. And he was doing everything he possibly could, including being another person, you know, in front of me, in front of the girls. So, you know, and, but at the same time too, you know, I, looking back, I, I would admit again that, you know, perhaps I didn't see it because I didn't want to see it because my life was just so perfect. You know, the great career and the beautiful house and the, you know, everything was going so fine. How could I have something ruin my perfect life? Yeah. Have, has anyone talked to him, your kids or you? No. Oh. And you know, um, he is being released in April of 2024. So this time next year, um, he should be out of the federal system. All right. Anything else you want to add? I appreciate your time, seriously. And I think what's interesting, for as long as I've worked with you, and even after you left, we never had this conversation. No, we did not. Um, and you and I, we, we were close. And, and I, f I felt your sympathy when all of this was happening. Yeah. And well, I mean, you always joked, even in the newsroom, you were my news mom. Yeah. Right? Yes. Like, and I kind of say, coming back to what I said, I said, you were... 
you were sometimes you were, you were pretty savage sometimes at work with some of the the people on critical but for me you had my back and i could always ask you stuff and i always right. appreciated that but i, I and could, you taught me a lot but you as well as many many others mm -hmm. at the station were so sympathetic but at the same time the conversations were awkward yeah you didn't know how to approach me yeah. and and most people in the newsroom did not know how they didn't know what to say you know when i came back from my leave of absence what are we supposed to say how are you marisa well <laughs> How yeah. do you think I am? You know, yeah. it was very, it was awkward, but I don't hold that against anybody. Yeah. It, of course it would be awkward. But I see it. You have a whole new chapter going on now, so. I feel, you know, it, it, there was redemption and reconciliation with myself and, um, and reinvention, I think. Um, and I have me. to say, throughout this conversation, you kept coming back to, I had to be there for my girls. I had to go yeah. get my girls. I had to take care of them. And I know your girls, and I've met them, and I saw them, you know, recent, just even recently. Mm -hmm. And they're smart, and they're bright. Yeah. And they got through this, and just they, like you. And they got through it. Thank yeah. goodness they got through it. Um, and, and hopefully they can lead a normal life because they've, they have a lot of life ahead of them. All right. So good to see you again. So good I mean, to see you. I mean, you've been in you. Denver or Colorado. Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. So thank you for coming here, having this chat and answering all these questions. And again, a lot more to tackle. So check it out, Marisa, my, my former news mom. Thank you for having Seriously, me. Seriously. Thank you. Again, it's just checking scores. Available where books are sold. I appreciate your time and seriously for opening up about You're all of welcome. that. I'll see you guys next time.